I spent a lot of the last decade resisting the capture of the psychological therapies by the state, by the Health Professions Council, the HPC. An alliance of UK councillors and psychotherapists formed and we put on several conferences opposing state regulation by the HPC. The e-hypnosis website I maintained kept up the pressure and I published three books about regulation. The Chief Executive of the Health Professions Council, Mark Seal, told me that psychiatry, psychology, psychotherapy, counselling and coaching were a very broad field and that he found it very difficult to know where to put the barbed wire and the guard posts. And eventually, the bureaucratic violence of the Health Professions Council morphed into the least worst option, the velvet glove of the Professional Standards Authority voluntary registers. This is how a service user saw what I was doing. As I leaned back out of this necessary resistance, I had a startling gestalt switch. All our attention had been on preventing the ruin of the psychological therapies. We had missed something very important. Around three quarters of the UK population for whom we thought we were campaigning get through life without professional psychological help. They work and play, bring up children and care for the elderly more or less successfully. So what is it that this 45 million people know and practice? The answer seems to be an addition to the list of commons that includes the air we breathe, the seas, the forests, the rivers and our genetic heritage. A self-sustaining feature of the human condition. I presently call it the Psy Commons. The Psy Commons is alive in us in three ways. Rapport, the felt connection with others. Chat, how we make sense of what's going on in our lives. And learning from experience, how we grow and change. Rapport is that combination of gaze, body language and physical contact through which we feel connected with each other. The feeling of being heard, being met, of the mutual recognition of life lived. The Psy Commons lives in us in a second way. Chat. The common names, images and ideas that we used to make sense of what's going on in our lives. Rapport and chat combine to give the Psy Commons a third human capacity. Learning from experience. How we grow and change. Between them, these three capacities of the Psy Commons, rapport, learning from experience and chat, generate ordinary wisdom and shared power. They give us what we need to become Psy Savvy, or at least Psy Savvy enough to be able to shape how and with whom we share our lives. We don't have to create or build the Psy Commons, it's a fundamental human resource. 
But that doesn't mean that it wouldn't benefit from validation, uh, enhancement and promotion. However, there are obstacles in the way of this. We have a House of Commons and one of its works, the Commons Act 2006, registers 4% of England and Wales as in common ownership. However, as David Bollier reports, by 1876, after 4,000 acts from the same parliament, 1% of the population owned 98% of the agricultural land in the UK. Agricultural land that had previously been in common ownership. This enclosure of commons for the benefit of the British gentry was mirrored in the colonial enclosures and exploitations of empire. Enclosures that became nations and who, after the burglars had left, were somehow persuaded to call themselves a commonwealth. This has been followed by their further exploitation and privatisation of commons resources. Enclosure by another name, such as the NHS. The NHS does belong to all of us. It's a commons. Like the global and agricultural commons, the Psi commons has itself attracted enclosures, enclosures of intellectual, practical and psychological ter territory. Key proposition, the Psi professions, psychiatry, psychology, psychotherapy, psychoanalysis and counselling have evolved as enclosures of the Psi Commons. I believe they demean, impoverish and damage it. How so? Well, let's back off a little. In the 18th and 19th centuries, as the grip of heritage religions on the Psi Commons loosened, the medical profession began to replace it and some doctors began developing psychological knowledge to promote and protect their knowledge and expertise as it grew. Psychiatry, psychoanalysis and psychology developed enclosures. They built professions. These psi enclosures, owned and operated by professions that had branched from medicine, brought with them the medical ethos, illness, pathology, deficit, disorder, dysfunction, diagnosis and treatment. A before long, unavoidable aspects of the human condition such as bereavement and anxiety, attraction, disappointment and resistance to oppression and even sexual diversity were seen as illnesses or, uh, to quote a euphemism, disorders. A recent edition of the Psychiatric Bible the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, DSM-5, has hundreds of categories of disorder. Intermittent Explosive Disorder, Oppositional Defiance Disorder, Hair Pulling Disorder. The idea of mental illness and its mirror image, mental health, was born. Let's look at how these professional sci enclosures were created and organised. Privileged access to countless meetings with clients enabled the Psi professions to mine the Psi commons and to extract and process the raw material they found. I'll repeat that. Privileged access to countless meetings with clients enabled the Psi professions to mine the Psi commons and to extract and process the raw material they found. And after haphazard beginnings, industrial strength effort was eventually applied to refining and distilling what was learned from the wounds, pain and distress of people whose psi savvy had been inadequate or overwhelmed. The result, a variety of psychological and pharmacological expert systems were developed. Expert systems devoted to treating the mental illnesses that the psi professions had discovered or that they had invented? All of this extraction and distillation was, and still is, held in tightly policed professional enclosures.
Did I miss anyone? Oh yes, the developers and owners of pharmaceutical patents. Globally, after the arms trade, the pharmaceuticals are the second largest international corporate business. These side professions and their enormously powerful corporate allies claim exclusive ownership of their expert systems. In the UK and elsewhere they have sought and mostly succeeded in having the state endorse their enclosure, possession and stewardship of this knowledge. From a Sci Commons perspective, all this has a very serious downside. While there are undoubtedly lots of caring, generous practitioners, the Sci professions and their Sci enclosures have a potent social influence. They have installed a widespread belief in the rest of the population about the nature of human condition difficulties. A belief that they are a dangerous territory, that they are a wilderness, They are full of mystery and threat, that monsters lurk, that there are swamps that can trap the unwary. Suppose I show signs of being overwhelmed by distress. Ooh, ooh, dangerous territory, unknown territory. The need for professional expert help is presumed. And the community resilience and resource of the Psy Commons tends to evaporate or, or move aside. This presumption of danger and a parallel expectation of professional expert rescue being necessary is very important. Together they generate a society-wide taboo against valuing and understanding the emotional and imaginal aspects of the human condition. And due to this, as I guess we have all seen, human condition difficulties are frequently denied or, or concealed. People know, we all know, that a mental illness diagnosis in our medical records invokes a near impossible to erase stigma. On top of this, resources are scarce and getting scarcer. You want to get access to professional sign knowledge? Have a crisis, I'm told. A crisis that may often be prolonged and consolidated by long delays in finding help. And the psychological help that we then encounter may often seem to wear the authority of medicine and professional gaze that's been trained to see deficits, dysfunction, disorder, pathology, illness and treatment. And if this wasn't enough, when we enter the side profession enclosures, the clinics, the consulting rooms, passive acceptance of the Psy experts' gifts is presumed. Shared power is very unlikely to be on the menu. Now, if you're a practitioner, none of this is intended to deny your capabilities. What I want to underline is that, yes, 75% of the population are sci savvy enough to get through life without the attentions of people like you from the sci professions. But that the sequestering of sci knowledge and expertise in these professions makes this Psy Savvy less capable, less freely available, less effective. Taken as a whole, the citadels and walled gardens of the Psy professions subtract as much or more value as they add to the human condition. They undermine ordinary wisdom and shared power. This, this, may, this may seem overcritical, but, but there is a silver lining. And I'm going to sidestep for a moment. The Psy Commons, being intrinsically wild, seems to know how to take care of itself. Non-professional ways of working with human condition needs have long been widely available. Alcoholics Anonymous being an excellent example. And there are also hundreds of survivor groups, five rhythms, dance events, self-help groups, and, and the Hearing Voices Network, etc., etc. Plus, the exclusivity of the Psy Professions enclosures is being broken by the internet. 
we are living through a Gutenberg moment. Exponential growth in the diffusion of knowledge, expertise and the potential for commonality. 2.4 billion people have an internet connection. I googled borderline and found 21 million internet pages. I googled depression and this brought up 151 million pages and when I last logged on to mumsnet.com which is highly recommended the am I being unreasonable thread had 265,000 messages. Gutenberg didn't only bring books out from the enclosures of the palace and the monastery. Printed books enabled reading. And in what I see as a strong parallel, the professional monopolies of psi expertise distilled from the psi commons are being broken. People may not yet know how to reproduce the psi expertise, but they know a lot about what it is. The professional genie is out of the bottle. Now, I guess one response is to reinforce the walls of the professional psychological enclosures. <laughs> Higher academic attainment, longer courses, tighter regulation, even more conferences in which the side professionals talk to themselves. Build, as it seems to me, an even higher wall between the side enclosures and the side commons. Or ways could be found of feeding the side commons. I mean, it's not rocket science. Lots of people swim a little, cycle a little, run a little. Tens of thousands run marathons. 20,000 cyclists capable of riding 100 miles past the end of my street a few months ago. All I'm talking about here is to make becoming Sai Safi as popular and well supported as becoming physically fit. So if you're a practitioner, be, become a part-time health champion, teach co-counselling, volunteer on a helpline, find ways of giving away what you know sharing your expertise. Part three of this series of videos will present some of the ways in which Sai Savvy is being enhanced outside of the professions and enclosures. I hope you'll join us there. <laughs>